Thank you for joining today's webinar, Setting Up Geo Containment Area. My name is Jodie Rizzay O'Brien and I'm one of the AWI Extension SA team. Tonight is also co-hosted by Penny Keynes from Livestock SA. This is the first of three webinars which is supported by the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund, the Government of South Australia, Livestock SA, the South Australian Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub, and AWI's Extension South Australia. Today's presenter is Deb Scammell from Talking Livestock. Deb's a livestock consultant in the Clare Valley where she assists producers with nutrition and production planning in both their sheep and beef enterprises. Deb consults directly to farmers and runs industry courses and projects. Prior to starting her own business, Talking Livestock, Deb worked in commercial and nutrition space in several different roles covering technical sales and national management. Deb has also been involved in a range of programs including sheep genetics, DNA and EID technology and extension to and sheep research. Deb graduated from the University of Adelaide with a Bachelor of Agricultural Science with honours in animal science and has studied ruminant nutrition post-graduation. Thanks Deb. Thanks Jodie. Thanks for all jumping on tonight straight after Easter. So tonight we're going to be covering containment feeding of ewes but we're going to be covering the setup and how to do a successful setup that makes it easy for you to feed the ewes um, and manage them in those containment spaces. So I'll be running through first one of the most important things I find, which is site selection. Um, so we'll talk about how slope sort of involved in that as well and how we make sure we're on the right sort of slope and soil type. Um, we'll then cover off on some pen design, um, some fencing types, um, but a lot of your pen design actually comes down to the feeding system you choose. So there's many different feeding systems and I'll also be covering those tonight and sort of the positives and negatives associated with each of those. We'll also touch on shade and shelter, which is fairly crucial depending on where you're sort of located, climate and the months that you normally have stock in containment. And I'll finish up with just some water in containment. The troughs I sort of recommend, um, you know, how to make sure your water infrastructure is going to work effectively. We'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So when we look at site selection, um, you know, I spend a lot of time driving around various farms and there's a few critical things that I want you to think about when you're looking at where you're going to locate your containment yard. Now, the first thing I love is having them located near to sort of a good set of yards. Um, you know, if you've got a sheep handler, your standard sort of handling facility um, and ideally your shearing shed as well. And the reason I recommend looking at these things is basically when you've got um, stock containment yards right near those areas, I find people will use them for a lot of other purposes. So they'll often be used for, say, quarantine yards as well for new stock coming onto the property just to make sure you tick sort of the box with biosecurity. But I also find them invaluable at crutching shearing. Um, if you can sort of hold extra mobs in those containment yards with a bale of hay, some water, you know, preloading on a truck, um, you can get them in slightly earlier and you've just got a good safe area you can use for other things. So, you know, I find some properties it's not possible to do that. You know, maybe it's too close to your house. But if you can't, looking at sort of laneways going back to those areas so that you do make them sort of dual purpose. The next thing is just looking at where your feed storage is. So, you know, ideally your hay sheds and silos will be in a similar area because it does just save you so much time when you're carting continuous feed out to those animals, as most people are doing this year. Um, you know, I do definitely have people that will set up a separate haystack or silos, again, if they can't get it located near them, but ideally it would be located near those two things. And the last thing is um, a good water supply. So we'll touch on water at the end, but making sure, you know, the best, less saltier sort of water on your property. Um, hopefully you've got a source of that water also near your containment yards. And we're also looking at continuous water supply that's sort of quite reliable. When we look at setting up containment yards, um, you do, you know, by the book, you're supposed to contact your local council, um, which they have regulations which now come under Planning SA, um, which containment yards in South Australia should be sort of registered. But the guidelines I've got on the screen are basically the EPA or Environmental Protection Authority guidelines for intensive animal feeding. 
So I encourage you when you're setting up just to make sure you abide by these guidelines. Um, because even some of the containment yards that have been put in and not officially registered, um, you can then go back and get them officially registered if they abide by these guidelines, you know, pending that local council individual knowledge. Um, but yeah, these things we need to stick by is basically 200 metres from a public sort of main road. Um, underneath there, if it's an unsealed road with less than 50 vehicles per day, um, we can go to 50 metres from there. So, you know, in general, when I talk about locating near roadways, I think keeping them out of visible sight from a roadway is a good idea anyway, um, just because, you know, we all know it's always the day you lose a few animals in your containment lot that you have someone going through, um, driving on the road that you don't really want that always visible by, you know, standard tourist traffic. The next one to look at is major water courses. So um, you need to be 200 metres from what is marked as a major water course and 100 metres from a minor water course, which you can get your SA government topograph, I can't say that word now, topograph graphical map. Um, and there'll be a little blue line on there and you need to be 100 metres from those sort of minor water courses and then 20 metres from your property boundary. So I encourage you to kind of to follow those guidelines but then within your own property, um, you know, looking at that convenience of having it near your stock handling facilities and feed storage, if at all possible, or as I said, looking at your laneways. When we look at locating the containment yard, the next important thing is the slope of that yard. Um, so, you know, we've got to look at water management and I find, especially in a lot of the dry areas where I sort of assist farmers to set up a containment yard, Often they don't think of that breaking rain um, being when the stock are in. But when we look at stock containment, you know, in high rainfall areas, we're often using it as that sort of gap while the pasture's getting away. So often you do have your wetter months, um, your May, June, you know, the break of the season while the stock are in. And even in drier areas, you'll often have that opening rain with stock in containment. So, you know, we look at it sometimes as a drought tool, but we need to make sure you can manage that water. So the picture I've shown you on the right there, you know, probably a little bit too flat. There's not a lot of runoff. I also see some containment setups where the water will run from one yard to the other, which isn't ideal as far as sort of animal disease spread as well um, for feedlots or containment yards. So yeah, ideally we have slope um, sort of from top to bottom of the pen and we like a two to 4% slope. Obviously the one on the left, which look, looks more like New Zealand, um, but, you know, I have seen even within Australia, people locating containment yards just on huge slopes. And what we get is just so much excessive erosion, um, but also we see stock sort of, you know, walking up and down hills daily, sort of expending more energy than they need, just on a really slopey pen. So, you know, that two to 4% is ideal. Um, you know, occasionally I've had people that have had to sort of do contours and manage water flow a bit better because you just cannot find the site that will tick on all the things we've just covered off. So, you know, generally when I'm running field days um, or working with farmers, you know, it's not always possible to tick off all of the perfect things. But, you know, I think if you go ahead with a bit of a list in your head, um, you know, often it's that we try and tick four or five, four out of five of the factors. And then you're not maybe using contours or managing your water flow because you don't maybe have quite adequate slope or you're having to divert water from flowing from one pen to the other. So we have to make use sometimes of the areas we've got that tick all the other boxes. But when we're looking at setting up containment, pen size is relatively critical as well. Um, so you know, I'm a real fan of sacrifice paddocks as a really good start to that containment feeding setup. So, you know, in most areas I've seen this season, you know, it does feel a bit like the long dry. Um, we kind of had stubbles and dry paddock feed that was probably four to six weeks ahead of where it needed to be. It's run out quite quickly. Um, so, you know, anyone that doesn't have a containment set up, I've got no problem with locking stock in those sacrifice paddocks, like the one you can see on the right. Um, the problem is you're just deteriorating a much larger area. So no problem short term. Um, but, you know, if you are containing year after year, an actual pen at the correct size is a much better way to go. 
So the problem with those sacrifice areas as well um, is often when it does rain, you get that short green pig growing up in that paddock and the sheep will sort of go off the feed a bit and chase that real watery feed around. Um, the one on the right is about a seven acre paddock. Um, and, you know, they are expending a lot of energy consuming little green pig that's really not giving them too much nutritional value. So, you know, in a pen of the correct size, you'll find that's not always an issue. Um, plus, you'll also get sort of a mat of manure and straw, which will kind of help hold the soil together a bit better as well. So that's where the advice of pen size comes from, is to kind of get that mat forming in the pen and also just not to have that green pig coming up. So, you know, in general, I like sort of seven to 10 square metres per ewe, especially when we're holding um, twin bearing ewes in sort of, you know, two to three weeks off the point of lambing. When you look at um, other areas, I've found some high rainfall areas or spring lambers, often they're in quite early in gestation. No problem then to go down to sort of five square metres per you and that's similar to what I set up for lamb feed lots. But you know, in general, when I look at pen size, I look at around five square meters per lamb, 10 square meters per you. And you know, with plenty of clients, I often set up sort of dual purpose pens. So, you know, we're able to run basically double the number of lambs in a pen as what we can use. When we look at mob size of you, so you know, looking at ideal mob size obviously also determines what pen size you're likely to build. So when we look at mob size, I like sort of, you know, around that 200 to 250 U. So, you know, my common pen size is around 2,500 square metres, which is suitable for 250 U's, um, you know, slightly higher number of U's earlier in gestation, or you could put 500 lambs in that same pen. So that's typically where I'll, the sort of pen size I'll be setting up. But when we look at pen dimensions, um, we start to look at the different feeding methods, which I'll go through shortly, and that'll determine how much fence space you actually need to feed along as well. So I'm just gonna touch on fencing setups in containment because I probably find a lot of people sitting on the fence sort of knowing they need containment pens, but you know, not making the leap to sort of put something in. So I guess I want to point out with some of these photos that the fencing for a containment pen is really quite simple. So we're looking at just sort of standard ring lock um, or hinge joint wire, um, nothing special about it. Um, we look at droppers um, three to four metres apart. So we still do need some relative strength in the fence just because you are running reasonable mobs in there, you know, depending on if you're just having sort of quieter use or whether you're putting feedlot lambs through as well. Um, but yeah, generally just droppers and ring lock works quite well. Um, obviously trying to get the fence strained. Um, I'm a really big fan of double fencing um, with sort of some kind of shelter belt path planted in between, but only because, um, you know, I find often mobs will, if they get a fry, especially feedlot lambs, they will knock down those central fences where the visual barrier can seem to be more effective. So, you know, if you can get your budget around a double fence, I sort of find long-term most people are relatively happy with what they've done between mobs. But as you can see in these photos, plenty of people will just do a standard ring lock fence between mobs and it still works quite effectively. Now, the picture I've got on the left is just um, a feeding setup where the sheep are actually putting their heads through the fence to feed. Um, so when you look at these types of fences, um, often people will use sort of stay tight cable, which will allow the stock to put their head through and you can also re-tighten that easily. Um, the picture shown there looks more like just plain wires, but allowing a decent gap sort of for the ewes to get their heads through um, without jumping into the trough is, you know, one of the good sciences with feeding sort of through a fence. Sometimes people will turn the mesh upside down and have some big squares at the bottom where you will put their head through. But I find, you know, potentially that wire ends up pretty loose and not looking great quite quickly. So my preference would probably be plain wires or stay tight cable as the one or two wires sort of above that feed trough. 
Also having your fence sort of lifted a little bit from ground level can help because often with straw and hay being fed in containment rations, um, it can allow just some of that to blow under the fence rather than just continuously being stuck in the fence. So sometimes people will lift the mesh up a bit and just have a plain wire at the bottom if need be as well. But I guess these are really pointing out, as I said at the start, the fencing can really be quite simple, um, but just needs to be um, obviously strong that we're discouraging animals from getting between pens. We also look at sort of laneway setup. So, you know, I think when you start to get over, you know, one to 2,000 ewes, um, you know, recently been involved in some fairly large containment setups for sort of seven to 8,000 ewes, it is worth looking at that stock flow in and out of pens. Um, so often a central laneway to load the containment pens each side will work very well, especially if you can do sort of the crown of the slope and then you've got the slope going away from the lane from each side. Um, and also just then having your gates opening into the lane and often people will have a separate blind gate on the other side of the laneway. So you can actually block the whole lane off and just let you load and unload sort of pens themselves. So having a think about that stock flow um, and also just the width of your laneway. So, you know, I've probably found some newer setups will do quite a narrow laneway because they're feeding out the back of a ute, for example. Um, but I sort of always encourage you to think a bit to the future. So, you know, you might go to a tractor or a mixer setup that's going to need a bit more space. So it can be worth making your gateways and laneways maybe a bit wider than your current equipment. So I'm just going to go through feeding systems. So, you know, I find this a really probably with people looking to set up, this is the thing I'd spend the most time on just because I find there's so many different methods of feeding in containment. And I find it a real way up between how much money you want to spend on sort of infrastructure mixes, you know, automatic sort of setups versus um, kind of time you've got. So, you know, sometimes spending a bit more money on infrastructure can help save time. Um, but in saying that, you know, I've got some probably quite cheap setups that are still really quite quick um, to feed the sheep sort of daily or second or twice a day. But I'll run through all of these methods. And as I said, it's a real individual sort of setup, whether you've got a workman with a bit of time, um, you know, whether you've already got sort of a feed out car, um, we can then tailor a feeding system that kind of fits your property. So, you know, one of the quickest ways to feed is to just have a trough in a fence line, similar to that picture I just showed you. So the picture in the middle there, um, that's the stay tight cable you can see there just above the trough. Um, that trough's been made out of poly belt, um, which is available from a company in Queensland. Um, and they actually send it down in lengths. So, you know, that makes really effective sort of troughs. Um, but on the left hand side is just a shade cloth trough, which is quite cheap, but you know, often you have to replace it every sort of three years. They often last for around then, and then you start to get holes in them and they sort of fray and things. But the one on the left, um, you know, one of the very big advantages of a shade cloth trough is the water goes straight through um, and they're really easy to clean because you just flick them up. So that's just been hemmed and has a wire running down each side. But yeah, when we look at feeding in a trough in a fence line, um, most people would either have a trough even on the ground, like a conveyor belt or a poly belt trough can be quite low to the ground. The stock will stick their head through. Um, and, you know, you can often just feed out of a bin off the back of your ute or some of the trail feeding carts will have a side spout that you can just spit into there. But the problem with these, you know, often you'll have your fibre in the pen and then every you know, day or second day, depending on where they're at and what their energy requirements are, you'll be what I call slug feeding grain. And so the problem with this setup is we need a lot of fence space. So because the, your slug feeding, say once a day or once every second day, you need all of your ewes to line up at once. So, you know, for a normal South Australian sort of merino, um, I work on 35 to 40 centimetres per ewe in trough space to get them all to line up. Obviously it depends on the mature weight of your ewe and also how much wool they have, but that's what I would allow in setup. So 
you can imagine for 250 ewes, that's a huge amount of trough space. And then we find those pens become quite rectangular. So you've got that large feeder trough access at the front, and then the pens aren't overly deep, um, but just very long and rectangled along that feeding lane. But it does mean you can feed stock without moving them in and out of pens, which I just find a real quick, easy way to feed animals. The picture in the middle is a total mixed ration, um, which is in a trough in the fence line. Um, so that's been chopped up by the Keenan that you can see on the right. Well, that's a new one, but an older Keenan has chopped that TMR. Um, so a really effective way to feed as well. Um, you know, I often design rations, if you've got a large capacity trough like that, that we can just feed sort of three times a week. Um, and because of the fibre content and that the whole rations in that mix, um, basically they'll just pull up eating and we know that we've only, we've got, th um, you know, two and a half days of feed in front of the number of ewes in the pen in that trough. So it can sort of reduce labour just because you're feeding less frequently. They're also getting a real consistent ration. Um, but the negatives there are basically the cost of the mixer that's capable of chopping large amounts of straw and grain. Um, so that's slightly prohibitive if, if you don't have um, something, although I've got plenty of people that have accessed secondhand mixes that are doing quite a good job for them. When you get to a TMR, because the feed's available all the time, we actually need to only allow sort of 14 centimetres per ewe. Um, so straight away we can reduce that trough space in the fence if we've got feed available all the time, rather than slug feeding that we're doing on the left. So another method which can help with that fence space, trough space sort of issue is to just put feed troughs in the pen. So these have been manufactured, the troughs you can see in the picture, um, just with galvanised iron and the farmers have made up their own sort of frame. Um, so those use um, basically, I'd allow then still 35 centimetres per U, but because they've got double sided access, um, we then look at only 15 to 20 centimetres along that trough um, because they can access both sides of the trough. So it can help, um, you know, if you're slug feeding into those. Um, these can also have a TMR in these, which would mean you only need seven centimetres sort of double sided access per U. Um, but the problem with this setup, which some people don't love, is that you do have to open the gate and drive into the pen. Um, so, you know, that can be tricky when you've got hungry ewes coming over. Um, you know, a second man or a good dog can make this um, a lot easier to do. But I find, you know, some people just don't want to drive into pens of ewes and just find it really time consuming. So it's worth thinking about if that's an option for you. The other option, which is quite popular, um, but you know, I find also has a few negatives associated with it, is just self feeders. So once again, with this setup, you know, in a containment ewe ration, especially this year with good quality hay, I'm relying on a lot of sort of hay and straw early in gestation. But you get to the point, especially with twin bearing ewes, that they will need some grain allowed. So when we look at um, bringing grain into a containment ewe ration, often they're only needing sort of that two to 300 grams, say of barley a day. Um, obviously using cell feeders, a lot of you guys have them anyway, you know, can be uh, easier and cheaper because they're gonna be used in the paddock too. You can often just fill them up once a week, um, but I often find ewes will really over consume. And especially in a containment pen, um, when they've got nothing else to do, you find that big fat U that's already over condition score four will be banging her legs on it, going over there 10 times a day. And, you know, she'll always manage to get that six to 700 grams when she doesn't need that much feed. So, you know, a good option. I've got some clients that are really pedantic about monitoring consumption through a cell feeder and actually having a really good result with self feeders but I have others that sort of come back halfway through seeding and realize the ewes have eaten seven times more grain than what they wanted um, so yeah it depends on types of self feeders so obviously the lick feeder types that you can lock down can be a lot more effective at being able to control that grain consumption but also I think depends on how pedantic you're going to be um, about sort of monitoring intake through those 
So yeah, different to a feedlot lamb setup where we're often wanting big open feeders and add big grain. Um, I want sort of shut down feeders and yeah, often small amounts of grain in a containment ewe ration. So yeah, but still a good option if you're able to monitor it effectively. So the other way a lot of people are feeding um, is basically a communal feeding yard. So what we've got with a communal feeding yard is we often have, you know, two containment pens at least, sometimes four containment pens that will open on to sort of a communal feeding laneway. Um, so the picture on the left, that's just magnus troughing, you know, some people use just C-section, um, but the advantage is, you know, you can just have a trough low to the ground, often they're pegged into the ground, um, but because you've got two, three or four mobs all feeding off the same area, it can significantly reduce your setup costs um, with that feeding lane. So you can see the picture on the right is a ewe sort of waiting on the hill. Um, they're fed their fibre in the, in the pen. So in this setup, it's rolled out sort of every second day. And then they're given their small quantity of grain, um, you know, so these twins are often only on, as I said, that three or 400 grams a day. So that's trail fed out every second day. Um, basically trail fed out with no use in the way, open the gate, you know, within no time they're trained, they all run over, allowing again that adequate head space. So 35 centimetres single um, sided or 15 to 20 centimetres if you've got double sided like we've shown. Um, and then they're all able to line up at once. You know, they'll eat that quite quickly, 15 to 20 minutes, and then they'll often just put themselves back in the pen. So, you know, it does take a bit of time um, to feed all of the mobs, but, you know, if you've only got two pens per communal feeding yard, it's often just that 15 to 20 minutes, then you're letting the next mob in, um, often feeding the fibre while the second mob's eating, and, you know, then they'll put themselves away and then job's done. So really depends on the number of ewes you're running and how many yards you've got feeding onto one communal yard will determine how long that sort of process is going to take. But as a, you know, a cheap and probably fairly easy and also quite reliable as far as the ewes all getting a consistent feed. And also it's really apparent when you've got sort of shy feeders or animals hanging back from that sort of feeding trough. So um, one of the ones we've had a bit of a swing to, um, you know, during my nutrition webinar in a couple of weeks, I'll cover a little bit more, you know, some of the issues with high quantities of grain we find with sort of calcium deficiency and other mineral sort of issues we get as user lambing. Um, I've had a lot of people swapping to sort of more silage based systems um, or high quality fibre in general. So, you know, especially this year, we've got really good quality cereal hay in most of the state. Um, you know, vetch and loosened hay, really high quality again, especially compared to the hay we cut in 2022. Um, so it actually is possible to sort of satisfy twin bearing view requirements just with fibre. But yeah, silage often cut a bit earlier, um, you know, can even be higher quality again. So, you know, often, we've been able to just feed silage or high quality hay. Um, and, you know, twin bearers in some years when fibre is a bit lower quality, will just have a very small quantity of grain at the end. So, you know, as far as being able to feed, it's a really easy process because often we're just putting bales of hay or bite bales of silage over the fence. So one of the last ones I wanted to show, and it's probably gained a bit more interest recently, uh, is the use of automatic feeders. So, you know, I've found quite a lot of people setting up um, these for lamb feedlots um, because it does sort of help that introductory process as well. Um, but they can also be used for containment feeding use. So what we see with the auto feeders, um, you've got the silo at the end. Um, there's two sort of brands that are marketed for sheep at this point um, and they have sort of different positives and negatives um, but basically we get varying lengths of trough so the longest one we can get is around 57 meters at the moment um, and you can see there they've got a pen either side um, and what those auto feeders will do is they'll dial up a, an amount of grain through a centerless auger and it will fill the trough so 
when you've got lambs in there for a feedlot ration, it can work very well because it will just keep filling the trough as soon as they've eaten any and it will be full ad lib feeding. Um, the problem when we're containment feeding ewes, as I've said, we're often wanting lower quantities of grain and higher amounts of fibre in the ration. Otherwise, you're just going to go way over the top with energy. Um, so often we only want that auto feeder, you know, dialing up, say, 300 grams a day. It might do three feeds of 100 grams per ewe, but then we go back to that slug feeding situation again. So the problem we have then um, is, you know, with a 57 metre trough, you're basically wanting all your ewes to line up again. Um, so at 35 centimetres per U, single sided there, fence is shown in that picture, you're only going to get sort of 162 U's being able to line up along that. So yeah, I I love the technology, but the problem is the cost of that sort of setup versus the number of U's you can get around it when you're feeding small amounts of grain. But you know, in some cases, people are using it for lamb feedlotting and then it does allow you to contain and feed a smaller number of U's in the pen also. So, you know, a bit of a summary there. Um, I've got a sheet, happy to sort of share, but, you know, the top one, as we said, any feed that's available sort of ad lib as a total mix ration. We're looking at sort of 14 centimetres of trough space required, um, single sided per ewe. Um, when we're doing that slug feeding or that ground sort of trail feed, we're looking at that 30 to 40 centimetres single sided. And, you know, with cell feeders, I often just go to sort of around one cell feeder per 120 use for a standard cell feeder. But as I said, your automatic feeders will go in that second bracket where you still need that 30 to 40 centimetres just because it is feeding just that amount of grain, you know, three times a day. If the ewes don't get in there, they're going to miss out basically. And that'll be your tail or your poor performers when you come into lambing. So I'll just touch on a few little bits on shade and shelter. So as I sort of said in the introduction, it depends a lot on what time of year you're likely to be containing. So, you know, if you are in a cooler climate um, and you're containing not in the heat of summer, potentially not as critical, but, you know, as you guys know, even on a day that's sort of mid-20s, sheep will often look for shade if it's available. So I think when we're looking at locking animals in a yard, um, I always like to talk about shade and shelter and definitely build it into a pen if possible. So, you know, there's many different ways to provide shade for stock, um, some expensive, um, some a lot cheaper. So, you know, the photo in the middle, um, if you're lucky enough to have beautiful trees, I find, you know, sometimes people will choose their location based around trees or scrub. The critical thing to remember is to fence those trees off. So, you know, in a yard like that, when there's huge trees in the middle, often well mesh set back from the trunk of the tree. In um, areas with real scrubby sort of trees, often just real narrow sort of um, bird aviary wire just so the sheep actually can't ring back the tree. So around each individual trunk that you want to keep. So, you know, I always see it, people locate it around this beautiful scrub and trees and you go back two years later and it's all dead. So making sure you protect those trees is really critical. But obviously the cheapest, most natural form of shade. The picture on the left, so that's a um, more of an extensive setup that's similar to the shade they use in cattle feedlots. So that's come from Queensland. Um, it's a real heavy duty shade supplier. There's massive cable along the side. Um, the farmers actually rigged it up themselves with wooden posts. Um, you know, that that was a cheapish sort of setup um, when it was installed sort of six or seven years ago. I think it worked out about $1,000 a pen. Um, but like everything, that cost has probably doubled. But, you know, a pretty substantial bit of infrastructure, um, you know, that's going to last many years. And then on the right, you've sort of got the opposite extreme, I guess, just made from bits and pieces around um, some shade cloth. You know, I guess we always think we need some extreme high shelter. It really is just the sheep that need to get under it. But, you know, that probably is a bit tricky if you're trying to clean out pens. But, you know, a real cheap way just to effectively give them um, a short-term sort of shade option. 
Um, another one that's really popular um, on the left. So we've just got shuttles. Um, so these are just heavy shoot duty shade sales, um, often just ordered online or from your local sort of Mitre 10 or Bunnings. Um, but yeah, basically these are just de shackled onto shuttles. Um, yeah, pretty easy, very easy to move. Obviously, you can clean under them. Um, you know, if people are a bit more pedantic about their shade sales, they'll pull them in in the off season, fold them up and bring them out the next year and they'll last quite a while. But yeah, having that central stack of shuttles just gives you the option to have many of those wings coming off. Um, so, you know, probably working on that three to three metres, three to four metres, square metres, sorry, of shade per sheet. But obviously as the sun moves across, you've got that shade spreading across the pen. And when we look to shade as well, um, generally we want it sort of located north, south across the pen because we actually want the sun sort of moving across the shade. Um, so especially in higher rainfall areas, you don't really want the same area of the pen shaded throughout the day um, because you don't want it to dry out if you've had sort of a weather event. So looking at that location and orientation of the shade is relatively critical as well. On the right, um, you know, they're just old um, veranda setups that were being pulled out of the local school. So that's been a real effective way to set up shade there. Um, and then you can see there the old man's salt bush planted in the fence lines. So, you know, in some of the drier areas, I love that as a sort of shelter belt, often just water it for the first year. It seems to survive any sort of climate after that or lack of water. Um, but as I said, that's that real visual bar barrier between pens. You know, if it grows into the pen, the sheep will just nip it off anyway. Um, so that can be a really good um, option for shelter as well. So I guess in high temperature areas where we're containment feeding over summer and autumn, um, you know, we're showing through the heat stress project that Adelaide Uni is doing some of those effects of heat stress sort of over joining in pregnancy. So you know, I really encourage you to think about shade in those areas. But then in some of the wetter, cooler, windier environments, um, shelter can be just as critical. Um, you know, they can be good pens and if sheep don't have a huge wall covering, it can just provide you a bit of extra protection against the elements. So, you know, when you've got them locked in there for one to two to three months, it's worth thinking about making those stock a bit more comfortable as well in those weather events. So just to finish up, I'll just touch on water in containment. So I sort of talked about it earlier when we're looking at setup. So obviously looking at those areas of your farm that have higher quality water. Also then when we look at how animals are going to water in containment, um, I like to now look at quite low volume troughs rather than, I think there used to always be that advice about the length of the trough and having plenty of water available to sort of keep it cool. Um, we're probably a bit different now where we look more about low volume and fast flow rate. And it's just because, you know, with the dust in some containment pens, um, we are cleaning out water troughs quite frequently. So on the left um, is quite an effective cement trough. Um, it's an all-in-one, it's sort of plumbed down through the cement, the float sort of well protected, but quite low volume. And what we're looking at as we're cleaning out troughs, um, basically we're just not dumping a heap of valuable water on the, um, on the ground. And also looking at having your water troughs on the bottom of the slope if possible. And we also want the runoff to go out of the pen, just so you're not left with a big wet patch in your pen the whole time. And it's worth thinking about sort of cement aprons and things like we can see on the left, um, because, you know, over time stock will often just erode away under your water troughs and feeders and things like that as well. So the one in the middle is just a polymath to sort of sweep out low volume trough. So, you know, you've got to look at something really easy to clean. You know, you're not dumping a heap of water there, very easy to clean. And then the one on the right is just a homemade um, storm water pipe. I've got lots of people doing these, you know, varying frame setups, often just a six metre length in a pen. And then you either see round holes or square holes cut out the top. But, you know, often we'll have them the bung sticking out into the laneway um, or on the low side of the pen. You could walk along, open the bung, flush the trough out, put it back on, it fills quite quickly. And again, you haven't lost a heap of water.
So all we want to do is make sure we've got really quick refill. Um, and I find these won't really get hot because stock are drinking quite a lot in containment on a hot day. It's constantly replenishing. And as you know, as soon as the stock hear that water being fresh, they'll often just go to the side and try and drink that fresh water anyway. So the continuous fresh water is more of an advantage than having a huge volume trough. So on the right, just a bit of a reminder for header tanks. So, you know, you've got say 5,000 ewes locked in a containment pen. I like to have a backup of two to three days water at least. So, you know, you think about it's always Easter Saturday that your pump breaks down and, you know, you've got a few days before you can get it fixed. I've often got people that will say they're going to let all the ewes back out and then they'll bring them back in again. But, you know, post scanning, I have ewes sorted in, you know, twin singles. We often pull off some skinny twins there in a separate pen. Um, it's a massive job to let them all out and then put them back in their mobs again. So, you know, I always encourage looking at a header tank, you know, ideally on a hill, um, two inch pipe going down to your containment pen, fast refill, but you've also got say three days backup of water um, up your sleeve if something does go wrong with your water infrastructure. So, you know, looking at some guidelines there, you know, young sheep, two to four litres, roughly consumption per day. Um, older dry sheep are going to drink sort of two to six litres per day. Um, if you've got lactating ewes or ewes in late pregnancy, they're going to be drinking a little bit more than that. And if you're containing on hot over the heat of summer, um, you can have 40% sort of extra water requirement above these figures. So, you know, if you've got an adult sheep during normal months, I probably work on five to six litres per day when I work out ahead of tank um, sort of consumption. But if you're likely to have them in there over the heat of summer, um, I'd probably go up to sort of that six to seven litres per ewe per day. Um, yeah, times it out by your number of ewes, times three days, and that's the capacity you want in those header tanks. And so looking at water quality, um, you know, hopefully you're all not getting up really high in um, total dissolved solids or your salt level of your water. Um, but, you know, I do find on some properties, we've got areas of the property, say, that might be 10,000 plus, um, some at five to 10,000. In general, um, you want your containment yards on your better water. So, you know, often I find across bores across the property, you might get a fair range. Um, so when you're determining location, I'd really be looking for that PPM of less than 5,000 in dissolved salts, um, so your salt level of that water, just so it's suitable for your pregnant, you know, young weaner lambs or all those times you may be likely to use those pens. So, yeah, considering all of these things, um, you know, I've probably given you a fair bit to think about as far as, um, you know, finishing on water quality there, so knowing we're near the water but also those different sort of things I want you guys to think of um, with sort of your site location. And then once you've chosen your perfect location, um, I'm then wanting you to think about, you know, just simplifying that fencing. Um, and then we also want to be looking at, I guess the next thing is the feeding method that's going to suit you guys. So as I said, that's basically just looking at, you know, time you've got available, which, you know, I find most people are time poor these days. So it is just finding the quickest um, but most effective way you can feed. Um, and then, you know, any infrastructure you might already have available, like a mixer or a feed out cart, that can really determine what might be the best way for you to feed without, um, you know, purchasing a heap more sort of equipment to do it. But yeah, in general, I guess getting all of those factors right I find, um, you know, will contribute to the success of how the containment feeding sort of goes, which, you know, the whole goal is that we're going to increase land survival and sort of get extra lands on the ground and reduce our human mortality um, and obviously increase the sort of ground cover of our paddock. But yeah, I'll finish up there. If anyone's got any questions, I'll hand back to um, Jody, who will take some questions, I think. Thanks, Deb. Um, we've got a few questions that have been submitted by um, people listening tonight. Penny's got the first question. Um, I'll hand over to you, Penny. 
Thanks, Jody, and thanks, Deb. That was great. Um, I've got two that have, that I've um, been thinking of. So uh, there's a lot of issues with dust. What are your thoughts on managing dust and the conditions that um, that can occur in you know when dust is a problem? Yeah. Yeah, so dust is a real issue, especially in the first year of having those containment pens. So um, it depends a lot on your soil type, obviously. So your lighter soil types often create a lot of dust in that first season. And it goes back to what I sort of said about your pen space. So looking at that five to 10 square metres per animal, um, you'll actually reduce dust. And it's just because of that mat of manure straw and things that forms on the surface and prevents that dust sort of flying around. So often I'll, you know, encourage people, especially in a year like this, where there's probably a fair bit of straw around that's not costing a fortune, um, probably cut a few extra bales, let that mat sort of form. And I find the second year after a bit of sort of weather on it um, and then compaction of the hooves and the mirror and urine and straw, um, we often don't have so much of an issue in the second year. Great. Thanks, Deb. Um, a question here from the audience. Um, we talked about water and water quality there. Where can you send samples off for testing? Yeah, so um, there's different places you can send um, water samples. So a lot of the local landscapes board will actually do a salt level, so just the salt PPM at no charge. So it's probably worth inquiring with those first. Your local pool shops can also do that test. Um, but if you want a substantial water quality test, I use APOW, which is a lab in Adelaide. Um, you can look them up online. I think it's apow.com.au and they'll give you salt, but also other all your other mineral levels in your water. Um, so, you know, when we talk nutrition, I quite like to know what the stock are also getting out of the water when they're in an intensive sort of feeding setup like that. So Deb, further, does that cost approximately of the Yeah, so I off? reckon it potentially has, may have changed slightly, but last time I did one, which within the last few months was $99 um, plus GST, I reckon, fair water sample. But yep. yeah, it does give you a lot of information and it will also flag whether you're higher or lower than what you like um, within certain parameters for minerals. So it can give you a first bit of a heads up if you might have an issue. Excellent. Um, Penny, you had another question for Deb? Yeah, just another one, Deb. I think you might have already answered it, but I, I will still pose it. Um, there's a lot of information here today. What is the one thing if someone is looking to set up containment, what is the first thing they need to think about? Um, and how do they go, like, where, they, where do they get help to actually achieve what, what you're trying, what they're trying to do? Yeah, so I'd, probably the first one is site selection. I'm going to give you two, even though you asked for one. Um, but uh, yeah, site selection, um, which is all the reasons I said early on, just that it's dual purpose. I just find people that have them close to where they're handling sheep just never regret um, where they've located it because they just can't believe how many times throughout the year they use it. Um, but the second one is really that feeding methods but not only for now, um, but also for the future. I just find a lot of people build um, how they think pen should look. So they just have a narrow area to the laneway um, and, you know, a rectangle going the opposite way to what I talked about with a trough in a fence. You know, they start with self feeders. Within a couple of years, they wish they had a trough in the fence line and it's just impossible to turn those pens around. So, you know, I sort of encourage you to, I guess, get some advice. Um, there's lots of webinars being done now. I think there's a lot of consultants that are quite experienced in containment feeding. So yeah, I encourage you probably to get a fresh set of eyes, even if it's just your neighbour that's done it, to look around your farm, help you with those location and set up things. Um, because often, you know, you might just set it up slightly differently thinking of the future. Awesome, thanks Deb. Great. Thanks Deb. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I just wanted to remind you, um, this is the first of three webinars with a focus on youth containment. Um, the next one is on the 17th of April um, on um, nutrition for youth, again presented by Deb. Um, please register for that. If you can't find the link, um, please flick me an email and I'll send that through to you. And then our one on the 1st of May is with Chris Shide about managing your bank manager. So we encourage you to um, register for those.
I just want to thank um, the supporters of the webinar series, the Australian Government, the Government of South Australia, Livestock SA, the SA Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub, and AWI Extension South Australia. We thank you all for joining for today's webinar. Deb, we thank you for sharing your insight and expertise. If you think of an additional question, you can contact me directly by using the information on your webinar registration. We thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening.